Today on Cook's Country, Christy makes Julia the perfect hearty beef lasagna. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of mozzarella, and Lon makes Bridget a new weeknight favorite, chicken scarpariello. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The introduction of lasagna into the American culture dates all the way back to the spaghetti houses of the 1800s. These humble bohemian restaurants were found on the side streets of big cities. They served inexpensive meals to young couples and starving artists. Now you could get a decent meal for 30 cents and that included soup, fish, pasta, a roast, plus a cup of coffee. Mm. Now lasagna started appearing on these menus in the 1920s, but it wasn't until after World War II that Italian food, and Frank Sinatra, became popular all over the country, making lasagna a household name. These days, old blue eyes would never recognize some of the more adventurous lasagna oh. recipes. Buffalo chicken lasagna, anyone? <laughs> Not today, thank goodness. Today, we're celebrating that hearty, beefy lasagna that made it an American classic in the first place. A traditional meaty lasagna, also known as a lasagna bolognese, can be a serious undertaking, complete with homemade noodles and not one, but two sauces, a creamy bechamel and a long simmered bolognese. And it is the ultimate lasagna. It's delicious, but it takes all day. So the question for Christy is, can you keep the flavor but speed it up a bit? Yes, you yeah. can. <laughs> it doesn't usually happen, but we're going to do it today. All right. So we're going to start with our noodles. OK. I have about four quarts of water here that I brought to a boil. I'm gonna add a tablespoon of salt, and now I'm going to add my noodles. When well, you think about saving time, you think about using no-boil noodles. Those are not no-boil noodles. They are not. These are traditional curly lasagna noodles. So you're actually adding a little extra time to this lasagna. We are, but we're saving so much time everywhere else. So we thought it was worth it to spend the time to get that extra sturdy chew and texture of traditional noodles. We'll let the noodles cook for about six to eight minutes until they're nice and al dente. Okay. And let's get started on our meat sauce. Mm, star ingredient. Yes. What we found with a lot of meat sauces is that as they cook, the meat gets kind of dry mm -hmm. and kind of pebbly. So our solution was to start with a panade, like we do with meatloaf or meatballs. So I have two slices of hearty white sandwich bread that I've torn up into little pieces, and I'm gonna add a quarter cup of milk. I'm just going to mash this until I get a nice paste. All right. So we have our panade. Good looking panade. Why, thank you. <laughs> I pride myself on my panade. <laughs> so I'm going to add this to my meat. Now, this is a meaty sauce. It's one and a half pounds of 90% lean ground beef. Usually we go for fattier cuts, saying they have more flavor. Why 90% here? Because we wanted to be able to control the fat in here. Ah. Um, it's gonna bake in that casserole dish and there's nowhere for it to go. By using the leaner grind, we could keep that greasiness in check. Makes sense. I'm gonna add a little salt and pepper, half a <laughs> teaspoon of pepper, and three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. <sighs> Time to now get I'm dirty. going in. I'm going in. <laughs> Take off the jewelry. Time to go in. You can try to do this with, <laughs> with a spatula, but... Which is kind of therapeutic to get your hands in there and squish <laughs> really the meat around. Does. I am going to wash my meat hands, <laughs> and then we'll come back and we'll check on the noodles. All right. So, Julia, I just checked my noodles. Mm -hmm. They're ready to go. So now I've already sprayed this rimmed baking sheet with a little vegetable oil spray mm -hmm. because we don't want them sticking together. So I'm just going to toss them gently, let these cool, mm -hmm. and start working on the sauce. Using the same pot. Yes. I like it. See, easy and quick. <laughs> I'm going to start the sauce with some extra virgin olive oil. I have one tablespoon. I'm going to heat this over medium heat just until it shimmers. Which shouldn't take too long because that pot's pretty hot. It is quite the hot pot. So we want this lasagna to be very meat forward, but we will add some onion. This is one onion chopped fine. We're just gonna cook these until they've softened. We don't really need to go all the way to full browning. So that's just gonna take about five minutes. We have soft onions mm, here, Julia. They smell good. You know what's gonna make it smell better? What's that? Garlic. Ah, oh, you're right. I've got six cloves that I've minced and a teaspoon of dried oregano and a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes. As soon as we can start to smell it, about 30 seconds. Can you smell that oregano? Oh now? yeah, it smells delicious. So now it is time to add our beef mixture. Now we're not gonna cook this for very long. I'm just gonna break it up because we just want this to cook until it's no longer pink. So I'm just gonna cook this for about four minutes. Do you see any pink meat in there? I see no pink. There is no pink. Now we'll add the last element, which is 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes 
That's also not a lot of tomatoes. So this isn't really a big tomato-y lasagna. It's really all about the meat. It is about the meat. So I'm just gonna make sure that I scrape up any good brown bits that got stuck to the pan while the meat was cooking. Now I just wanna bring this to a simmer and then I'll reduce the heat to medium low and let it cook for five minutes. Just long enough to let the flavors melt. Our meat sauce is done. Oh, nice. That was fast. Five minutes. Love it. So now we're going to start on our white sauce. That's not a bechamel. It's not a bechamel. <laughs> no. Again, we're trying to save a little time. Um, and other recipes try to save time too. Often they'll use ricotta, but ricotta tends to get kind of grainy when yeah, it gets it really, really does. hot at higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. We found that cottage cheese works really well. It's a bigger curd and it holds up to those high temperatures without getting grainy. Smart. So that's what we're starting with. I have a cup of cottage cheese in here. I'm also going to add four ounces of Pecorino Romano. This is actually about two cups once you've grated it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also add a cup of heavy cream because we need it to be <laughs> saucy. And add some flavors, of course, a little bit of garlic. It's two cloves that we've minced. And I'm adding a teaspoon of cornstarch, and that's gonna help bind everything, mm -hmm. and it's also gonna help thicken it a right. little bit. And then a little salt and pepper. I have a quarter teaspoon each. I'm just gonna whisk this. That was the easiest bechamel I never made. <laughs> <laughs> it is very easy. Okay, now we're gonna head over to the construction zone. <laughs> Right, because you have a lot of components here. Putting them together looks like it might take a little bit of time. It's like an erector set. <laughs> now the first step is we use some vegetable oil spray, spray the whole bottom so the noodles won't stick. I'm gonna take three noodles. Now look, these perfectly fit. Nicely. Unfortunately, that's not always the yeah, case. Yeah, this doesn't always happen at my house. Right, and we're looking for sturdy, not shoddy construction. So <laughs> right. if you find that the noodles don't fit all the way to the end, we took two noodles and cut them in half. Ah, cut and to so, fit. Yes. I like it. That way you have noodles the whole length of the dish and everything is a lot sturdier. Okie doke. I'm gonna take some of my meat sauce. All right. About one and a half cups. And we'll pour this. Oh, I'm getting so excited. Mm, me too. <laughs> and then I'll take half a cup of my sauce. And this I'm just kind of Dollop. It's not going to be a totally smooth coverage. That's right, because when it hits the oven, it's going to melt and make us off. And if there wasn't enough cheese here, I'm adding a half cup of the mozz. Now, this isn't the pre-shredded stuff. This stuff looks a bit stickier, which is pretty important to buy block mozzarella and shred it yourself. That pre-shredded stuff doesn't melt the same. So now we'll start the second layer. All right. And like I said, it didn't fit your pan and you were using a half sheet, mm -hmm. say at this end. On the second layer, you want to make sure you put the half sheet. Oh, the alternating the cut to fit so it's an even construction. Yes. Yeah, you might have missed your calling. You should have maybe wear a hard hat. <laughs> We're going to finish this one and then do two more layers. So we have four layers, and then we'll talk about the topping. All right. We have finished four complete layers. Mm. And that dish is full. It is full. Now that's it? a lasagna. It's hearty. So now we have the last layer of noodles, and if you were using half sheets of noodles, you wouldn't add it to this top layer. All right. And you're also not going to add any meat sauce. Well, that's good, because there's none left. We worked it out that way. That's <laughs> smart. Because if we add a meat sauce to the top, it keeps it a little wet. Mm -hmm. And if it's wet on top, then it's not gonna brown. Ah. And the brown, cheesy top. It's the best part. Exactly. <laughs> Instead, we're gonna add the rest of the white sauce. So just kind of get it spread pretty evenly. Now we have the rest of our mozzarella. Mm -hmm. Should be about a cup left. And we'll sprinkle that over the top. Now we're gonna add a little bit more of that pecorino, mm -hmm. just another quarter cup. Because this is an aged cheese, it's a little drier. Right, so it browns better. It's gonna brown beautifully, so there we go. Now notice that I have this sitting on a rimmed baking sheet. Right. Because this is very full. Yes it is. And we don't want it to overflow. And I'm also going to cover it with some foil. I did spray this with vegetable oil spray. So we're gonna put this in a 375 degree oven, uh -huh. middle rack, for about an hour. Okay. We're gonna go in halfway, take the cover off. That's the smell right there, the smell of success. Look at those spotty brown oh, bits. But that looks lava Ooh. hot. I mean, It is, is so hot. So we have to wait half an hour. That's gonna give the cheese and the sauce a chance to kind of set up so we can cut those nice squares. I think it's set now. Awesome, time to eat? Yes, absolutely. The whole making of lasagna, the hardest part is getting the first slice out looking pretty. This is like operation now. You're using the double spatula technique. <laughs> Look at. Oh. You nailed it. All right, I'm going in. Okay. 
Man, that's good. The chia sauce, it really thickened nicely. It did. And it's just kind of gooey. Yeah, and it didn't break. It doesn't have any of that graininess you get with ricotta. No, it's very creamy. And very beefy. Finally, a lasagna that tastes like beef. Christy, this is the perfect lasagna. Thank you, Julia. Mm, thank you. For a streamlined, meaty lasagna, start by boiling traditional noodles, then drain them and let them cool on a greased baking sheet. Instead of making a long simmered bolognese, make a quick meaty tomato sauce with a panade, 90% beef, and some crushed tomatoes. Skip the bechamel and make a no-cook white sauce with cottage cheese, pecorino, and heavy cream. Assemble the lasagna in a very sturdy fashion in a greased dish, bake for an hour, and let cool for about half an hour before eating. And there you have it, from Cook's Country, the ultimate hearty beef lasagna. So good. <laughs>Last year, the average American ate nearly 11 pounds of mozzarella cheese. I mean, body by cheese have we got. And Jack is here to tell us which supermarket brand of mozzarella should top our pizzas. So this is a really <laughs> interesting taste test. We shredded all the cheeses. Some of them started out as a block. One of them might have already come as shredded. Interesting. So you can dig in. Okay. Um, you may want to just use your fingers. There's no great way to do this. I'm going to do that. Um, we did do a test with pizza. The pizza is not here. I noticed that. Yeah. A couple things that we're going to pay attention to. One is, uh, is there any dryness? Now, we brought the best of the seven shredded cheeses, but all the shredded cheeses are coated with cellulose, and it gives it a little dryness to keep the shreds from clumping. So can you pick that out? Okay. Second thing is fat level. Some of these are whole milk, and some of them are part skim. Whole milk cheeses have closer to 48% fat level. Uh, the parts game is closer down to 42 or 43% fat. And you can tell the difference in the richness. It also will affect how they melt. Uh, the whole milk cheeses melt really lovely. Mm -hmm. The last thing is moisture content. Most of these cheeses are labeled low moisture, which means they have between 45 and 52% moisture content. But our two favorites were not labeled low moisture. And when we did some lab work, it turns out they're somewhere in between what I think of as pizza cheese, which is a low moisture mozzarella, and that fresh stuff that you might put on a salad. The moisture content there would be about 60%. Interesting. So, anything you're noticing off the bat about these three lovely samples of, <laughs> you know, shredded cheese? Well, this one, I feel like you put baby Swiss in there instead. Uh, it tastes sharper. Um, um, and it's very interesting. Good, interesting. I'm trying to figure out if it's a ringer. <laughs> Am I, I at the right cheese tasting? Would I do that to you? You know, it's not a bad cheese. I wouldn't call it mozzarella, though. Um, this one is the pre-shredded. I can feel it, powderiness on my tongue. Having said that, sometimes I'm really busy. I love having an option of pre-shredded cheese. Yeah, and you're not going to eat it out of a bowl like this. Oh, I probably would, but <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Once it's melted, I'm not sure that I would notice it. This is beautiful. It's creamy, it's soft, and it's nicely seasoned, too. It's definitely my favorite. Okay, all right. I all can, right. Yeah, you want to see how you did? I do. Congratulations. You chose the winner. Yes. This is the Palio Whole Milk. Uh, it was a block cheese. Now, the studio audience, this was not their favorite. Interesting. Which was interesting, but the expert panel, this was their favorite. And I love how neutral and creamy. It's got a little bit of seasoning. High moisture, high fat. It's a good cheese. I'm going to check all the way down here and see if this is pre-shredded. You got this right. All right. Uh, this is also from Palio. It's the whole milk, but it's pre-shredded. And honestly, if you look at it, it kind of looks like it was shredded by a machine, yes. not by somebody with a box grater. It's so true, and definitely not by me. That's way too perfect. Uh, and let's check out this baby Swiss that I think you threw in there. So this is from Organic Valley. Huh. Um, the studio audience loved this. Our expert panel, I think, was downgrading it because it tasted different than the other cheeses. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sharp. It's funky. Right, uh, right. And I guess this is a funky audience. You guys uh, are funky. You know, they, <laughs> they like funky cheese, but it's really not conforming uh, to the classic flavor profile of a mozzarella cheese. Right, it's almost cheddar-y. Well, there you go. To top your pizza, pick up our winner. It's the Palio Whole Milk Mozzarella Cheese. It runs $5.99 per pound. <laughs> Today, we're making chicken scarpariello. Now, what we know about the dish is that it comes from the area of Naples in Italy, not Florida. What we don't know is really where that name comes from. So scarpello in Italian is shoemaker. So one could patch or cobble the dish together 
And Scarpariello means a shoemaker's assistant. So an apprentice could buy all the stuff on a cheap wage. Now other people, you know, tend to get a story that's a bit more flowery. The studs of garlic remind them of the nails on the bottom of shoe. I don't know what's true, but what I do know, Lon is going to show us how to make great chicken scarpariello. Yes, yes I am. This dish is awesome. It features really nicely browned chicken with sausage, peppers, and onions, and you can't go wrong you with really that. You really cannot go wrong. Chicken, sausage, peppers, onions, you had me there. Yeah, right? One of the other things I love about this dish is you don't dirty too many pans doing it. It all happens right here in this 12-inch skillet. Weeknight dream. Right? got a tablespoon of oil. I'm just gonna crank it up to medium high, and while that oil heats up, let's prep the chicken. All right, the main ingredient. Yes. I've got three pounds of chicken parts here. You can buy them in pieces. You could break down a chicken if you'd like. The fat's been trimmed off. I've cleaned up the pieces a little bit. The last step is just to cut the breasts in half. That helps them cook through a little faster and everything finishes up at the same time. Great. I'm just going to cut through this skin, and when you get to the bone, um, instead of cutting down, I'm just gonna press. Just cracks right through. Yeah. That's great, we're using chicken with the skin on and the bone in, that's going to add a lot of flavor to this dish. After the pieces are cut in half, pat them dry. Getting rid of that water really speeds up browning and we want the crisp skin mm. and the flavor. Okay. A little bit of salt. If you don't mind, sure. would you pepper for me? You got it. All right, I'm the pepper lady, yeah. just bring me in. I'm just gonna go wash my hands and we'll start cooking. Sounds good. Now that that oil is smoking, let's get the chicken in the pan. All right. That's a good sound. Right. And Lon is cooking all the chicken in one batch here, so it's really important to get that pan and the oil superheated. If she were to not let the oil go up to the point where it starts to smoke, the pan would be too cold, all the chicken goes in, that oil temperature drops, and the chicken would steam rather than brown. Uh, I'm putting in the chicken skin side down. I want to make sure I get a good sear and help some of that fat render off. Okay. And I'm not going to touch these and just let them do their thing. It's going to take about five minutes on this side. We'll flip them over, give them another three to brown the second side. But in the meantime, we can go prep our peppers. All right, sounds good. I have one red bell pepper here, and I'm just going to take the bottom off and the top but we're not throwing those away, we'll use them. And then open it up, run my knife along the ribs to remove them. Beautiful pinwheel action you yeah, have going on right? there. And then it's already nice and flat and we'll just go and slice. Now, as for these tops and bottoms, I'm just gonna run a knife through them. They're perfectly good, no reason to not use them. And then we move on to our pickled peppers. I'm using hot cherry peppers for that kick of heat. They're nice and briny and salty. And I'm just gonna cut the top off, scoop out the guts with a spoon, and then run a knife through. Now, this is one of five cherry peppers. It's going to yield about a half a cup once it's prepped. Bridget, this chicken looks great. Five minutes on that skin side gave it this gorgeous color and three minutes on the bottom, it's fantastic. I'm gonna get this out of the pan. All right. So that pan looks beautiful. That's lots of flavor in there. Right, so I have eight ounces of sweet Italian sausage with the casings removed, and I'm just gonna break it up into kind of bite-sized pieces after it is broken up. Just gonna leave it alone, let it brown, stir occasionally. So it's been about three minutes. This looks great. You can see a bunch of the fat has rendered out and the sausage is nicely browned. I'm just gonna transfer this to a towel-lined plate to get rid of that extra fat. I'm just gonna pour it out and reserve one tablespoon. So now that the sausage and chicken are done, let's get our vegetables into this skillet. I've got one onion sliced thin and that bell pepper we worked on earlier. Just gonna stir it around as it cooks and I'm just looking for the vegetables to pick up some color, soften a little bit. It's been about five minutes and the onions are nice and wilted as are the peppers. They're starting to color. It smells so unbelievable in here right now. Oh, we're not quite done yet. Let's get those cherry peppers in. This is five cloves of minced garlic. All right. And lastly, one teaspoon of dried oregano. Just gonna give this a stir and make sure that the garlic is cooked out and those aromatics bloom a little bit. This will take about one minute. So now we're gonna begin building our sauce. This is one tablespoon of flour. I'm just gonna sprinkle it in. So it's not a super thick sauce, it's just enough to add a little bit of body. Right, this gives you a nice silky texture and it clings better. 
to the chicken and the vegetables. So I've got three quarters of a cup of chicken broth. All right. That's a good sound, deglazing the pan there. And two tablespoons of the brine from those pickled peppers. A little pickle brine. Yeah, it's fantastic. It is. It's sweet, salty, a little sour, a little bit spicy, too. Yeah, it's perfect. As you can see, it's come up to a simmer. The sauce is starting to tighten up. Mm -hmm. and that's it. We're almost there. I'm going to turn this off and stir in that sausage. So now... The chicken goes right on. It's like the peppers and the sausage are acting as a rack holding the chicken above all the sauce. Yeah, the skin is staying well above mm -hmm. the liquid and it's going to stay crispy while the chicken finishes cooking. That's great. So this is going to finish in a 350 degree oven. I've got the rack in the middle position. It's gonna take 20, 25 minutes. Okay, great. Doesn't that smell great? It smells amazing. So it's been about 20 minutes. Really? And I'm just going to check the temperature. And I'm looking for the breasts to register about 160 degrees. There we go. Perfect. All right. And the dark meat, the thighs, and the drums, we're looking for 175. These look great. One last bit. I've got a little bit of chopped parsley. It's about a tablespoon. Beautiful. It just adds a little freshness to this and some color. Now it looks Italian. Right, we've got the <laughs> colors. You ready to try this? I sure am. Here is a little bit of the dark meat, mm. a little bit of the white meat, and the vegetables and sausage. All right. Yeah, you're right. The skin is yeah. still nice and crisp. And the breast meat is still really juicy, really tender. Yes, I would say that looks juicy and very tender. Right. Mm. Got the sweet flavor coming through with the bell peppers. Got a little kick coming behind it with that briny cherry pepper. And that sauce, it's nice and silky. It's not running all over the place. It's not broken. It's fantastic. Thank you, Lon, so much. This is spectacular. Well, it's easy to cobble together dinner if you have the right ingredients, and it's just that simple for chicken scarpariello. Start with browning the chicken, then sausage right in that chicken fat, followed by onions, red peppers, cherry peppers, and a little oregano. Toast flour in the pan, then deglaze with broth and cherry pepper brine. Put the meat back in the pan and into the oven it goes until it's all cooked through. So from Cook's Country, a shoe in for dinner. It's our fantastic full-flavored chicken scarpariello. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes on our website, cookscountry.com. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>